All right, good morning. Well, this is our final installment in our our Sunday School class series on the topic of evangelism. So we've done a number of different teachings. We've done also something different. We've done um, several discussion panels where we've basically talked about things, but it hasn't been always open for questions. What we'd like to do today is do some question and answer. Um, So a few of you emailed us in questions, which was helpful. So we will privilege those and get to those first. And then after that, if you have a question, we would love to have you uh, ask that. And if I can just be the bad guy here for a moment and just remind you, if you have comments or a story or input, we love discussion, but discussion is for after or for small group or for some other time. If you would help us, I think the way we can best serve the entire group here today and the way we can best serve those that are watching later is if you would ask questions that are questions, because that facilitates, I think, the best... um, Kind of content for our discussion this morning. So if you start not asking a question, I just ask Stephen to be the bad guy and play bad cop and just cut you off and say, hey, we'd love to hear what you have to say after class, but if you have a question, we'd love to hear that right now. So Stephen's going to be the enforcer on that. Um, So don't make us be the bad guys. Uh, That would be helpful. So let's pray and we'll get into some of those questions. And uh, and again, our hope is that this would be encouraging and, and equip you to better fulfill Christ's calling for us, that we would share the gospel and be faithful to, uh, to do the work of evangelism he's called us to do. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for uh, the time we have this morning. Thank you for the privilege it is to be included in your mission, to uh, get to be ambassadors for Christ and share the good news of what you've done for us. Lord, we confess our need for wisdom as we engage with many different people, many walks of life, different situations as we engage in different types of conversation and we're always trying to figure out how do we bring this towards Christ? How do we appeal to people? How do we call them to faith and repentance? Lord, we pray that you would equip us, that you would direct us to the places in your word that would, um, that would inform the way we do evangelism. Lord, we don't want to be driven by pragmatism. We don't want to be controlled by the fear of man. We don't want to rely on the wisdom of man. We want to Rely on your word, be obedient to your word, and do this the way that you want us to do it. So we ask that you would help us to that end. Lead us by your spirit this morning. I pray that uh, for Dan and Stephen and myself, that our input would be faithful and that it would be um, helpful to those who desire to serve you and share the gospel. So bless our conversation this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we got two questions that were sent in, and I'll throw these out to you guys just to, to start with. Um, And the first is one that I think we've talked about a little bit before, but we can always talk about it more because it's a real-life situation for so many people. And that is, would you have any specific counsel for parents on how to best continue to share the gospel with their prodigal adult children? Um, Stephen, you and I have some pastoral experience here. We've ministered to a lot of people who are in this life situation, and we both have family members that are not necessarily our children, where we're a little bit aware of this dynamic, but none of our children are out of the house yet. Dan, your kids are, so you have a little different um, experience in this, but I think all of us would probably agree on on some of the biblical principles, but what are maybe just some some principles you would share, encouragement you would share to someone who wants to keep sharing the gospel with an adult prodigal son? What do you think, Dan? (laughs) Okay, there we go. Wow, that's a tough question. It's tough because there's not a perfect answer. Every one of your kids are different. Every relationship is different, right? Um, I know what my kids grew up in, and I knew what they heard, and so they know. And then there's this miracle that has to happen, right? It's called conversion. I can't convert my kids. You can't convert your kids. We can't convert them. And so our job is the same thing that we're doing in the world, is making the gospel known. And so at some point, uh, my kids know, and I keep praying for them, and I keep loving them the best I can. Um, But for us, I don't deviate from a line. I tell my kids, and and I'm in these situations, I'm particularly in one very difficult situation. Um, How do I say this? Um, I'm... We are the lighthouse. This truth is the lighthouse. And for me to cave on the truth would be to doom my children. And you've probably seen that happen. Parents who have a a prodigal, a wayward Mm -hmm. child, and they don't want to lose that relationship. 
And so they compromise yep. truth. Yep. That's spiritually deadly for you and your child, yes. like you're saying. Yeah, and I can say that with a tear in my eye. I can say it with love to my kid, but to help them understand that for me to move from this position is doomed for you. Mm. And I can't move from this position. Absolutely love you. You're welcome here. Adore you, love you, pray for you, but I can't move from this posture. It would be wrong for me to do such a thing. And that's their only hope. Mm. That's their hope is that I won't. And so... Um, so you would say that... Just your yeah. faithfulness as a parent is a witness to be steadfast yeah. oh, and yeah. Absolutely. sticking to the truth. Yeah, that's it's helpful. a thing that doesn't move. Yeah, yeah, and so, <clears throat> no, and, I'm, and so, yeah, I, there's probably more than can be said there, but every yeah. relationship's different. I've had to watch my kids go through their own journeys of working out their faith, if you will, you know, coming to places, that, oh, they look like they're converted, and those kinds of things, but <clears throat> you just can't make that happen. Yeah. We want to, right? We're desperate. We want our kids to be saved, but we can't do that. And so I was just, as an example, I was thinking of a good friend of mine who's incredibly faithful. He's in his 70s now. Um, known him for many, goodness, 40 years. And uh, his oldest son, you know, walked away from the family, walked away from the faith at, say, age 20. And just a month ago, I was talking to him on my phone, my, this friend of mine, his name's Russ. And he was talking about his son, who's now starting to come back and hang out with the family and talk. And he said he's not ready to trust Christ, but he wants to come, and he just said he sits here with Linda and I, the wife, and uh, we'll spend a whole week talking, but his son's 50 now. He walked away 30 years ago, and Russ and Linda, faithful ministers of the gospel, if you knew their ministries, it's incredible, and they've just had to stay the line for waiting and long-suffering for 30 years, and now at 50, their son's talking to them, and that's, I mean, that just sounds brutal, right, but it's like God can sustain that. Mm -hmm. It's God's job. God's business, right? So, That's helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was good to just emphasize even conversion is not a work that we do. Yep. We talked about that earlier in the class, but remembering that even with the emphasis on pro proclamation, it can be easy to conflate that with results. Remembering that we're meant to be faithful to God in the proclamation, but we trust him with the results. That's important. Two things that come to mind for me, it's more probably the... Okay. Swap. Give you the bad mic. Uh, one thing that comes to mind for me, and it is more related to maybe peers, which would be different than a parent-child relationship, but um, for me it's patience and being deliberate at the same time. Um, so when there's patterns that show up in a relationship, I have somebody within my family tree that I talk to semi-frequently, and um, there's this habitual complaining about work and there's a lack of evidence of salvation even though there's a lot of truth that's evident there um, I try to press into that and just say what does scripture say about that attitude that relationship that you say you have with the Lord but isn't bearing any fruit and so but that's not every conversation either where you're just constantly hammering in but you actually want to care and love for them um, and be intentional in that relationship. So I think patience, but also being deliberate and mm -hmm. praying for those opportunities to continue to shed light on the gospel and show how that applies. But there are some relationships where you don't get to talk for 30 years, and it's hard. I mean, just emotionally, yeah. that weight is really heavy um, to say, did, and you start questioning. Sure. So remembering and trusting God in those moments to say, no, I'm, I'm called to this truth, and I'm called to please the Lord first and foremost. And so that has to be the priority. Yeah, I agree with everything these guys have said. I would, I would add to that and just and really underscore, I think you both mentioned praying, praying for them. You, know, you may have a, a child who is unwilling to talk to you about Christ, unwilling to listen to the gospel. They can't ever stop you from praying for them. Um, that's not their decision to make. And Jesus says that, um, he, he tells this parable about a persistent widow who keeps going to this judge and pleading her cause until this judge, who's not even a righteous judge, he just gets worn out after a while. He says, fine, I'm going to give her what she wants just to get her off my back. And Jesus argues from the lesser to the greater, says, how much more will your father delight to receive your repeated requests? So he encourages us to persist in prayer. Keep praying. Don't stop praying for your child. And that may not be a direct gospel conversation, but that's something God uses over the long haul to, to soften a heart. And then I would just encourage you practically um, Dan, you said, I know my kids know. Um, and then you said, there's not a one-size-fits-all answer either. Every situation is different. If you don't know that your kids know the gospel, 
then you need to make sure they know. If you say, you know what, I took them to church sometimes when they were younger, but it really wasn't, the gospel wasn't clear, and, and I didn't understand it the way I do now, I don't know if my kids really know the gospel. Then you need to initiate a conversation. Say, hey, I, I know that you know we go to church and we're Christians, and, and you went to church with us when you were younger, but I don't know if, if I ever, as a, as a father, as a mother, was able to really explain the gospel clearly to you. Would you mind if I shared with you kind of what God has taught me over the years and what I understand to be the message of salvation? And ask them, and then share with them the full, clear, complete gospel. They may say, no, I don't want to hear it. But if you don't know that your kids know, then I do think you have a higher obligation to create an opportunity, not to wait for them to ask you not to, you know, um, try to just slip it in here and there, but to just directly say, there's something that's really weighing on my heart. It is of utmost importance to me. Would you be willing to, to, to let me share that with you? And just ask. And again, if they say no, they say no. And, and then you know, okay, I know that I've done everything within my power to, to transmit the gospel to them. But if you know that your kids know, <clears throat> you know they've heard it, you know it's clear, I'm guessing, Dan, your kids could probably explain the Christian gospel, even those who, I know you have one who's at this point not walking with the Lord. You know that they know. Um, So so that's important. Make sure that they know. And then I would say even after that, um, I I think I would encourage parents, even if you've shared the gospel, you know that they know. I agree with Stephen. You don't have to turn every conversation into a full court press where you're pressing for conversion. It's okay to ask them how their job is going. It's okay to... (laughs) Enjoy Thanksgiving dinner together and talk about something else and just to appreciate the relationship for what it is. That's not wrong. At the same time, I think it's wise to look for moments of openness. Um, Sometimes there'll be a crisis that happens in their life. You want to take advantage of that opportunity. Even if they've appeared closed before, when they get that cancer diagnosis, when they lose their job, when they have a miscarriage, say, hey, this... This is an opportunity. You can't not point them to the Lord in those moments. So when there's a moment of crisis, you want to be sensitive about that. You don't want, to be, you don't want them to feel that you're being opportunistic. You want it to come across as love. But look for, those, look for those moments where God may be creating an opportunity where they're maybe perhaps more willing to listen because of what they're going through. Maybe there will be a little crack in the armor. You want to look for those. Pray for wisdom to discern when those moments are. And then in faith, Lean into that, see what happens. You may get the door closed in your face, but that may turn into a fruitful conversation. Um, So I just say, you know, if they're open to talking about it, do. And even if they're not, just periodically probe and just ask, ask for opportunities. And then I would also agree with what Dan said. You talked about, I can't move away from the truth. I think there's sometimes where Christian families will sort of self-censor around their unbelieving family members. Like we talk one way when it's us as Christians all together on the dinner table, but then the moment, you know, dad is in town or the moment that that son-in-law is there, all of a sudden there's certain things that are off limits that we feel like we can't talk about anymore that we would otherwise have talked about. I would just encourage you to be authentically Christian all the time. You don't have to self-censor. And, and that's not a full court press and saying, right now, are you ready to pray and repent of your sin and believe in Christ? Just be yourself and be open and God, God will use that. So I would say don't, don't censor yourself. Dan's got a comment on that. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we're on the prodigal thing, and there's so many things going through my mind. But one is, you know, we talk about it often here in this community of believers, in that, you know, and I've already said it, but our confidence has to be in, in a great God who knows how to save. I mean, he loves my kid. He, you know, he has a love that I can't understand. We mm-hmm. could have that whole discussion. But he's way beyond me. And he can turn, flip a switch any moment in my child's mind any of our kids, any of our parents, anybody we, we love, right? He can, he can flip that switch any minute he wants. And so we have to keep that in the backdrop of our life. It's, and it's theological, right? It's the reality of who God is. He's a sovereign God, and he knows exactly what he's doing. And so we play our role, but I just we have to keep that there. That's, um, that's what gives you sanity. Mm-hmm. And that's because it's the reality. It's like, no, God's God. And so I, I just think, just brief, and I don't, yeah, I don't want to labor this, but I think of a story, um, a couple of you probably know because I've talked about it, but I was in Africa a number of years traveling and tra- training these church planners, and many times the conference would turn into a time, which actually turned out to be the most, most valuable time, where they just wanted to ask questions and answers like this and interact with you. And invariably, they would ask, what's an area of your life that's been very difficult? They want to know about suffering because they suffer so much. 
And a couple of different times I've shared the story of this, this child uh, that was a real difficult situation for us. And, um, you know, it's hard to talk about, but, you, you know, you, you're kind of generic and you just say this has been a real hard chapter. And in one of those settings, a gal came up to me afterwards. She pulled me aside, actually spoke great English, didn't think she did. Her name was Phil Kurta. And she said, I, I just want to, I, I felt like the Lord wanted me to talk to you to let you know um, that I was your daughter. My dad was a pastor. I walked away from the family. Of course, didn't have cell phones, anything. They didn't know where I was at for many years. I was involved in really awful religion, animal sacrifice, all sorts of stuff. She said, I don't even want to talk to you about it. It was awful. But she said, I was totally immersed in it, totally away from my family. My parents had no idea where I was. They wept for years. And he said, she said, I just want you to know something, that um, that entire time, I can look back now, I didn't know it at the time, but many things should have happened that didn't happen, and it was because the Lord was actually with me. His presence was with me through my parents' prayers and in life, and I can look back now and see certain circumstances that God's hand was there, even though I didn't know it at the time. And so her message to me was, I just want you to know you can rest. You pray and you rest, and God will do what he needs to do when he needs to do it. So I think that's the big big backdrop of all of our evangelism, though, right? We're trying to be faithful to the Lord. We're trying to deliver a message. We're proclaiming stuff, but we can't save people. I'm never going to give people a perfect answer even, right? It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. No, theology is practical. Oh, it yeah. shapes how we live. It governs our emotions and our thoughts. We, we need those truths. So keep your eyes on the truth. Pray for your child. Pray for yourself to have patience, to wait on the Lord, to have wisdom and discernment, uh, to know those moments to to point them to the Lord and to know when to be patient and just to wait. So that's good. Another, another question that came in, it was a longer question. I'm going to just sort of pull out the central sentence and, and summarize it a little bit. It says, how do you winsomely tell someone that no one is neutral, that apart from repenting and believing Christ, all of us are headed for hell, but that God in his kindness and forbearance will forgive and be reconciled with any and all who repent? So how do you... How do you tell someone that in a winsome way that doesn't seem like, and I think the, the essence of the question was, you know, we're not trying to, we can't force conversion. It's God's work. Yet we've made some statements here about there's really only one of two responses to the message of the gospel. You either submit and believe and repent or you reject Christ and you're headed for judgment. Like, how do we, how do we make that, how do we be direct and honest about that at the same time be, uh, be winsome because, and even as, as some of these stories we've already been talking about, we all know that there's oftentimes people reject the gospel, and then they reject it again, and then they reject it again. And then years later, after being around Christians, after hearing it many times, years later, conversion happens. So how, how do we live in, in light of that reality, at the same time be direct, tell them this message, if you reject Christ, you're heading for hell? How do we be winsome about all of that? Stephen, I'll ask you to start since you were. I'm gonna just steal indirect. the answer. You in can't the question. steal my notes. That's not fair. Oh no no no, <laughs> not your notes. Okay. I thought the question held the answer. I mean, apart from repenting and believing Christ, all of us are headed for hell. But God, in His kindness and forbearance, will forgive any who desire to be reconciled to Him and repent. Like I think that's good. Some, that's good news. That's winsome. Mm-hmm. That that in it holds the answer is that we're not. We, there is bad news in the setup, in the scene, if you want to say, but the solution, the resolve, the, the climax, the, the piece of the gospel that is good news is that there is forgiveness for those who trust in Christ, who repent and turn from sin. So the message is good news, and people know the bad news. I mean, God's Word says it's written on our hearts, so there's, there's a difference between coming to somebody and trying to condemn them and trying to show them that they are condemned already, um, those that reject Christ. And so I think recognizing that difference changes and transforms the tone in which you communicate about man's sinfulness. And also, I was just thinking this morning about um, the difference in how we're called to even forgive and show grace to others is rooted not in knowledge of circumstances, um, of others. Like, I'm not called to be gracious to people once I know what's going on in their life. Man, if I just knew how much trouble you were having, I would be so much more patient with you. It's actually rooted in how patient God is with me. Mm-hmm. And so recognizing my evangelism, if, I, if I'm coming across as harsh and cruel and rude, not, not that you can guarantee you know, those results of how people are responding, 
Um, but if you sense that in your own heart of the words and the tone in which you're using with others, um, what you need to do is go evaluate, do I really know and am resting in God's grace towards me and what has been accomplished in salvation? And if I'm trusting in Christ, I'm going to winsomely and persuasively, as Paul talks about, plead with people to, to recognize their sinful state before a holy God and to trust in Jesus Christ and repent and turn. Yeah, once again, thinking about a bunch of things. But one of the things that we said here is that, um, and again, it goes back to practical theology. I can't even convict anybody of their sin. Think about it. We have this idea, like, I, if I drill them hard enough, they're really going to come to conviction. No, they aren't. That's a work of God. And so I don't really have to drill somebody on that. I just have to deliver the truth. You know? And, and maybe you saw me flipping my Bible. I was thinking of Paul in Ephesians. He says, you know, we too. We too were under this wrath. I'm no different than you. We're all in the same boat, man. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I've shared with you guys, and again, it's more my approach. I'm not saying it has to be your approach, but my approach, even in this culture, is to talk about justice mm -hmm. and to move towards judgment. And everybody wants, which is really interesting, it's wired right in the heart of man, everybody wants justice, which is really interesting. People see things, right? This is why people are marching in the streets on things that we disagree with. They actually think it's a just issue. And so to use that to help them understand justice, that God is perfectly just, and guess what that means? Nobody gets off. And so for me, I'm not afraid to talk to, about judgment with people, to say God is a just God and judgment's coming, and judgment's leveled at me, it's leveled at you, and there's only one escape route. It doesn't even have to be an escape route, but God's so amazing, he gave us an escape route. Does that make sense? So, so it's not even so much you go to hell. I, it, to me, it's more we're all facing judgment. Now, the results of that is separation from God forever. It's what the Bible calls hell, yeah. right? But it's less that you go to hell. It's more you're under judgment. I'm under judgment. And so uh, that's the proclamation, the message that we bring, the news we bring to people. And then again, to me, it's a supernatural reality. The Holy Spirit has to bring conviction. The Holy Spirit has to bring that pressure, not me. And so it takes, it takes the pressure off me, feeling like I have to nail somebody with that. Yeah, so. yeah I think uh, Ephesians 4 says that we're to be imitators of God <clears throat> as beloved children. So the question becomes, well, how, how, is, how does God act towards the unsaved and the lost who are hearing the gospel and not responding? And Romans 2 uh, warns us not to presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not, uh, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. So God is patient. God doesn't demand an answer today, and there will never be another chance to answer. And I think you know, we've all heard, and it's not even wrong to, to let people know, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed another chance. You do need to respond. Um, because some people think, well, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll think about Jesus and maybe get religious, you know, later. But right now I'm kind of, you know, I'm in my prime and I'm kind of doing my own thing. And I don't want to be hamstrung by all this Christianity stuff. But later on, I'll, I'll probably think about that. We can point that out to people, say you're not guaranteed tomorrow. But at the same time, God is patient. And it says that his kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. So if I want to be an imitator of God, there should be some sort of evidence of patience in me. And some sort of kindness in me that is intended even to point people towards repentance. So it's not a harshness that brings people to repentance. It's kindness. And it's kind to tell them the truth and let them know that the consequences of a sustained unbelief is eternal judgment. It is hell. But that God has made a way. He sent his son. It is kindness to tell them that message. But it's to be done with, I think, a spirit of gentleness and patience. What is it? Second Timothy 2 where Paul tells Timothy to correct his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance. So there should be a gentleness and a kindness and a patience in us, even as we warn people about the truth of hell. I think you know, there's, there, there's two ways to tell people about the reality of hell. One way is honestly, even with tears. I think of Paul in Romans 9 saying, I wish that I myself could be accursed for the sake of my brothers. He wants to trade places with these people because he has that sort of compassion for them. That compassion just oozes out. And then there's another kind of you know, preaching or evangelism that is in your face and it's pointing your finger at someone. Oh yeah, you think you're laughing now at this whole Christianity thing. Wait till you've been in hell for 300 years. See who's laughing then. You know, like 
That's not, that's not useful to the Lord. We don't need to be like that. We can just tell people the truth. We don't have to be harsh. We don't have to be spiteful. There should be no sort of joy or gloating in our, in our preaching of, of hell. Should be, there should be a heaviness there. Um, but we do need to be honest with people. And if they don't listen, then we continue to pray. We be patient. We continue to be kind and trust that God may perhaps grant them repentance. It's not over yet. So, and I, I think, too, there's also maybe a different tone This is just my personal opinion. This is not a Bible verse. I'm curious what you guys think of it. You guys have probably heard me preach the gospel pretty forcefully in the pulpit. But when you're talking to a group of people, that's diluted just a little bit um, because you're speaking to a group. That's different than me talking to one person and using personal pronouns, you, you know, and and being as forceful and and and, and as direct. I think there's sort of a prophetic role with preaching where I probably feel more comfortable doing that with a group, knowing that that's going to fall on different people in different ways, and the Lord uses that. And when I'm dealing with a person one-to-one, I I don't usually take that same approach. So that's just personal opinion. I don't have a Bible verse to back that up as much as just observations of life, but I don't know if you guys would agree or disagree, but those are a few things that I would say in in answer to that that question. Yes. Yes, good question. So even if we're winsome and patient and kind, what do we do when people won't take it that way? And does that happen often? It happens often. And they accused Jesus of a lot of things that weren't true. They said, you're casting out demons by the power of Satan. It wasn't true. They accused him of being born out of wedlock, which wasn't true. They accused him of all these other things that just weren't true. And that just comes with the territory. So again, other people are not our judge. They may say that you are all sorts of things, but only what God says matters. So we, we're seeking the approval of one. It's an audience of one. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, any, any questions from something we've talked about this morning or maybe other things in the class? I have a few written down that, that I've sort of come up with, but any questions about evangelism as we're wrapping this class up? No, the Lord does that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Sure. And I'm Thanks, sure we, we, I appreciate we probably that, all got stories yeah. and, and things like that that would affirm that. It's so true. So, yeah. Any, any questions, though? Any questions about this topic of evangelism? Yes. Yes, so can you repeat the question? Yes, yes. So the question is um, several weeks back, we talked about evangelizing children, and a lot of that was aimed at parents. But how do those things, do they apply to grandparents as well? Um, you're a grandfather. Oh, well, I think so. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so how, how, would you, how would you answer that? Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure specifically, Connie, but yeah, we. We live the truth and we speak the truth to our grandkids. I do all the time, you know. I read them stories, uh, you know. Tina's good at getting those little children's Bible story books, you know, and I'm reading and talking about it. And I even tell my uh, grandkids, especially as they get older, well, not even that old, seven, eight, I'm talking to them about the people I'm praying for and I talk to them about people's lives being changed by Christ. And I share all that stuff with my kids, grandkids too. So they're hearing it. They get around grandpa and they're hearing this stuff, you know. Yeah. So... Yeah, 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 your grandkids are, yeah, yeah. And I, I, think the, I think the difference between being a parent and being a grandparent largely is in authority. You don't have authority over, over your grandchildren. So, so several of the points I shared that day were, had to do with discipline. So we need to hold our children accountable to God's law. Otherwise, they'll never know their need for a Savior. 
So we need to hold them accountable. So I really emphasize that and just said, basically, if you don't discipline your children, you're preaching to them an anti-gospel, that there are no, no consequences for sin. There is no judgment. They don't need Jesus. Repentance is optional. So I think permissive parenting undermines the gospel. But as a grandparent, you don't have authority. I mean, you have influence, great influence, but your approach is you're not going to be able to use that tool in the toolbox. You're, and it's very rare. So maybe some grandparents do, but your kids probably aren't asking you, hey, when, when little Jimmy and Johnny spend the night, feel free to spank them and discipline them in our absence. I mean, some families are like that, but that's more rare. Um, so you probably have to look for those other, other ways. So you, you pray with them, you share with them, you ask them questions, you listen to them, you point them to Christ, but you're not able to use that authority that a parent would use in terms of discipline um, and holding them accountable to God's law. I mean, you can appeal to their conscience with your words, but there's no, you don't have power for correction in terms of giving those consequences. So you're, you are a little more limited in that sense, but all the other things I would say still apply. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your, your question or not, but Yes, and you should. So with adult grandchildren, you know, they're not even, they're not even little kids anymore. So you're relating to them in a new way. Um, I think we as a church need to always uphold the sufficiency of Scripture. Yes. Like God's Word really is powerful. Yeah. Point them to the truth. Yeah. Keep speaking. Yeah, those are great thoughts, Connie. Um, there's somebody you're sitting pretty close to that I think had some great insight on this. <laughs> and, and he helped me understand something. He said, you know... Uh, and I think it applies to grandkids, and I think it would be great for everybody to hear. But he, he had told me one time that um, when his kids were younger, let's just say 20s, you're for the first row, not grandkids yet, he said, I was quicker to want to give them answers. They were slower to ask, I was quicker to give answers. And he says, now I'm at a point in life where they're quicker to ask and I'm slower to give an answer. I think that's great wisdom. I think it's true with even your grandkids, right? Like you've lived before them, they know they know where you guys are coming from. They know the things they're doing that you guys disapprove of, right? They know. And so I think in time, as we, and you guys have done an exemplary job of that, of being connected to your grandkids. I mean, I've heard all the stories, and it's fascinating. And you have set the table. You've set the stage by loving them, being in their life. And now there's a sense in which I think, and it gets just my opinion, right, but, like, you're waiting for that moment, right, at the kitchen table and you're sitting there enjoying something and all of a sudden there's going to be this moment where you could say, you guys know where I'm coming from, right? No, I, I do. I think you guys have set the stage for the whole thing. Better than a lot of people, really. So, Time for another question. Dom. And make sure I heard you right. Are you asking, um, sharing the gospel with those who have some sort of mental handicap or other limitation? Is that, that your question? Sure. So just speaking more broadly to that. Um, yeah, any input you'd have on that? Sharing the gospel with those who may have some mental limitations, developmental limits, things like that. Hmm. Um, so I haven't, necessarily had a lot of those, but I've had people walk into the church um, that are mentally not stable. Um, they're not all there. And my goal in that is to be very simple. Um, it's more like sharing with a child um, in the sense that I want to be as clear and concise as possible and get to the real heart of the matter. And um, in those instances, I think that's that clarity and that conversation, there's going to be less of the on-ramp. Um, even with some who are distracted and maybe ADD, like you need to be really narrowly focused rather than saying, I'm going to bridge on to this conversation and transition. There's not a lot of transitions going on maybe in their, in their mental capacity. And so um, being very direct is actually really important. Um, I remember hearing Pastor Brian talk with a kid at junior camp 
um, that had some disabilities. And even learning disabilities is really helpful because he realized I can talk to this kid a lot better, but it's very different than every kid because I can't look him in the eye. He will listen with precision if he turns and faces away and I don't look at him, but I'm talking to him even though he's beside me facing the other direction. And so sometimes just taking care to say, I'm, I'm not dealing with the same sort of conversation skill set that somebody else has. Um, how do I show care and love for them? That, that requires digging in deeper um, and, and maybe doing some more investigation to say, how do I show care and love in this mm -hmm. situation to this person, um, but also be precise and direct to, to the content of the gospel that I'm wanting to get to. Those would be some thoughts that Agreed. come up for me. Totally agree. If the person made in the image of God, they have a soul and they are a sinner descended from Adam and they need to be saved and the gospel is the only way and conversion, like we've been saying, is God's work. And his arm is not too short that he cannot save such a person. They are just as impossible to save as you and me because they have the same sinful nature. Um, and so it's, there's got to be a miracle of grace. And so give a simple gospel, point them to Christ. Um, and I think probably those conversations expose in us how overly reliant we are on mental, rational reasoning to sort of like get to someone's heart. And God can go a, a different direction, but the Spirit convicts and regenerates. So share the simple gospel and pray for them. Um, and, and God is able to save. I would trust that. It's a good question. T time for one more. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the most I'll recap. So how do we how do we share the gospel with someone going through a hard time but the specific crisis they're in is losing an unsaved loved one? Because you know, that well if I bring up the gospel to them, they're going to say, "So are you telling me that my loved one is now in hell?" That doesn't seem very persuasive. I think that's a situation we've all been in. We've all experienced that probably in some way or another like Okay, where, where, am I, where am I at with this? Any, any practical counsel you would give to a situation like that? I'll start. I'll buy you guys some time to think. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind for me is um, I want to know, am I sensing in them um, a reality of death in their own life? Um, if the topic is grief in their heart over the deceased loved one, um, that's probably a different focus than somebody who's been jarred at their own frailty. Um, that's the, the personal trauma I want to speak to, and I think is a bigger door. Um, whereas if their grief is over the parent, I actually want to grieve with them and cry because death is worth crying over. It's sad, it's grievous, it's part of the curse, um, and it is an enemy that will be defeated in the end by Christ. So I think recognizing where's their target and their focus, and that part of that grief process is they are eventually usually going to turn in to say, oh my goodness, what, what am I doing? Look how quick this can end, and that could happen for me. That's, that's to me a transition in that grief where I, I want to speak to that more directly because the focus isn't necessarily on, on the deceased one as much as their own, their own life. So that's a thought. <laughs> You go first. Well, I have, a, I have a bunch of thoughts, but I realize all these questions are doing the same thing for me personally, like stirring the same thought in my mind. And so I'll just emphasize it again. I still think, I think I would say I know, this whole enterprise that we're talking about is a work of God. And I know I've said that, but you really have to think about this. Like, like in a real sense, I don't know when somebody dies, I don't, I don't know what's going on in their soul. Um, on the face of it, it looks like they didn't trust Christ, right? But at the end of the day, that's between an individual and God. And so it's not even my job to figure all that out. Mm -hmm. My job is to help people understand the gospel. So when that conversation comes up, you know, we're talking about art of relationships and communication, and there's no perfect answer, but I feel confident telling people, this is what I do know. Mm -hmm. We're separated from God. See, I'm right back at the gospel. 
yeah. and we need to trust Christ. He's our only answer for sin. I don't know about the person you loved, where they were at in their life. I really don't know. I, I really don't know. We, I know. I know one man, it's really interesting. He was, his dad was dying of cancer, and um, he really wanted to talk to his dad about Christ, and he'd never seen his dad pray, never seen his dad talk about Christ. And he went to him and said, like, okay, Dad, I want to talk to you about something. His dad's close to death. And this will sound funny, but it's true. And he says, um, I want to talk to you about Jesus. And his dad said, well, son, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some of you know this story. It's, it's, but the point is, is you don't know what's going on in that man. Yeah. Again, from my appraisal, it would look like he's not a Christian. He doesn't know Christ. But you don't know everything that's going on there. And so my confidence is in God to save, for God to regenerate. God knows his. He will do his work. Mm -hmm. We cannot thwart it in a real sense. Mm -hmm. And this whole reality is he's invited us to, I always use the word participate. Somebody wrote me this week and said partake, which is a great word, right? Like, like we, we are in concert with God in this deal, and it's not inherent on my shoulders to do it perfectly. Mm -hmm. that, that's not what this is about. Yeah. I can screw up, and God still rescues people. That's his business, right? See, so I'm just saying, I'm not trying to like say my only, yeah. you know. It's not upon us to have the perfect, the perfect tactic, the perfect yeah. answer. Yeah, that's what it's I'm saying. It's not about our strategy. And so that is a yeah. difficult thing, Many I think about a lot. You know, I'm getting older. I have people in my life who are passing away, and some people I really wonder. Do they, I'm not sure they're, they know the Lord, you know. How, how do you address that? I still think we talk mm -hmm. about the gospel, and we, and we entrust God with that. And I don't have to say this is where that person's at, because in all fairness, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know yeah. what the gospel is, and I know what they needed to trust. That's good. I, I would echo what both these guys said. It's really not about our strategy. It doesn't depend on us and how, how perfectly we say it. Um, and so that should, give, that should fill us with uh, encouragement and faith just to say, okay, the one thing I can't do is just freeze and stay back. I need to love them, move towards them, point them to the Lord in whatever ways I can, and I don't have to do it perfectly. I just, I need to be faithful. Um, and then just emphasizing what Stephen said too, um, you don't have to even hammer that issue of, of the, like, find, find the, a, different, a different track. So I think about the evangelism we see in scripture. John the Baptist says, if you don't repent, you'll experience the wrath to come. So that's one track. That's one way you can do it. <clears throat> Jesus talks to Nicodemus. Nicodemus has questions about how do I gain access to the kingdom of God? So Jesus talks theology with Nicodemus. He starts quoting the Old Testament, talking about regeneration. He comes to the woman at the well, and he says, you're looking for satisfaction, and you've never found it in any of the men you've been with, and I can give you water that will satisfy you forever. So we even see in Scripture there's different approaches to getting to the same answer, that everyone needs Christ. So if you can... <clears throat> lean into a little bit of that grief and sorrow, point them to Christ, tell them what Christ can do for them. You don't have to directly even engage that issue. And if it comes up, like Dan said, you don't have to even explain all of that. But we do have to point them to Christ. We are out, out of time. You have a quick follow-up question on that? Yeah, you could do that. You, you could press into that, ask questions. Mm -hmm. What do you think happened to that one that died? Yeah, that can open up conversation. So there's pray for wisdom. There may be questions to ask. You may determine, you know, that's a conversation to have three weeks from now. But the conversation to have today is just to talk to them about the love of God and his comfort and compassion. And that God's plan is, actually has a way to undo what death does. And that's good news. So, and we can talk about issues of hell and judgment, that person's destiny another day. Don't always have to engage that on day one. I would say that's a conversation that's better later. So I'm sure we could keep on uh, discussing, but thank you guys for coming this morning. I want to encourage you to come back next week. Um, you guys know that we value scripture in our church. We hope that in the way we preach and the way we sing and the way our, our church functions, there's a value for studying and understanding scripture. We're going to be teaching a, a shorter class. It won't be as long as this, <clears throat> but Stephen's going to be walking us through um, basic Bible study principles. How can you study the Bible better for yourself? So whether that's something that's new for you or whether you've been doing it all your life, we think it'll be helpful as a refresher and an encouragement. So come back next week and we'll be starting that new, that new track on, um, on studying the Bible. So you guys are dismissed. We'll see you back here in a few minutes.